Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Meredith Curtis Good. I'm the communications director for the ASLE U of Maryland. Thank you so much for joining us for this um, virtual press conference about the ASLE U of Maryland's 2022 legislative priorities for the General Assembly. We are going to hear today from a number of ACLU staff members who are active doing work in uh, Annapolis, um, including Yannette Emanuel, our interim public policy director, Justin Nally, public policy analyst, and Frank Patinella, senior education advocate. Um, we will also hear from Jenny Egan, juvenile defender with the Maryland Office of the Public Defender in Baltimore, Tierra Hawks, chair of the Baltimore Civilian Review Board, and Davon Love, director of public policy with Leaders of a Beautiful Struggle. Um, this event is being recorded that we're gonna make available across our social channels later this week. Session begins on Wednesday, um, and we will take any questions at the end. So first, um, we're going to hear from Yannette Emanuel, who will open us off. Go ahead, Yannette. Good afternoon. Um, so today I'll open up by sharing the ACLU of Maryland's renewed commitment to the year's long race equity, um, race, equity lens, race equity lens that guides our public policy work. For several years, these goals have been the foundation of how our public policy department engages in advocacy in Annapolis. We see these goals as, the, as key to making truly impactful lasting change. First, we seek to disrupt the systems and practices that privilege people and groups with access to resources and disadvantage communities directly impacted by injustice and their ability to advocate independently for policy change. We will be explicit and dogged in our goal to shift power, resources, expertise, and other means of advocacy to the people who are directly impacted. We seek to center the voices and experiences of communities directly impacted by injustice during internal deliberations about our institutional priorities and strategic decisions. This means that the people impacted by injustice lead policy advocacy efforts. It is them who, uh, who need to make the key policy decisions about the reforms, um, what, about what reforms are needed. And we seek to disrupt existing power dynamics in the Maryland General Assembly that disadvantage legislators who are Black, Indigenous, or people of color, and legislators who represent BIPOC communities. Thank you so much, Inet. I'm going to now put into the chat the agenda for our discussion today. And all along, we are going to share. Uh, materials related to um, our policy priorities in the chat as well, but you can find them at the ACLU of Maryland's website, um, all, all in the same place. So next we will um, talk about the effort to legalize marijuana and at the same time establish community reparations. And we will hear from both Yannette again and also Davon Love on that issue. Thank you for that. So as we all know, the war on drugs has failed. And the most damaging aspect of this failure is how the criminalization of marijuana has been a pretext to over-policing Black, Indigenous, and people of color for decades. So the question is not, should Maryland legalize marijuana? The question is, how can we legalize marijuana through a racial justice lens to address the onslaught of harms that have been selectively aimed at Black and Latinx communities? Decriminalization was not enough. Serious racial disparities continue. Because despite Maryland decriminalizing possession of 10 grams or less of marijuana in 2014, and despite comparable rates of use among Black and white people, Black people continue to be arrested overwhelmingly more than whites at disproportionate rates. National trends reveal that on average, a Black person is 3.64 times more likely to be arrested for marijuana possession. In some Maryland counties, people, Black people are arrested at double the national average. For instance, in Queens and County, Black people are eight times more likely to be arrested for marijuana. In Carroll, uh, Cecil, and Frederick County, Black people are six times more likely to be arrested for marijuana and five times more likely in Allegheny County. At the same time, the legal marijuana industry in the United States is booming with a projected revenue of $89 billion by 2025. However, only 4% of cannabis uh, businesses are Black-owned. 
the contrast between the booming legal marijuana market and the continued criminalization of Black people for marijuana use and the lack of opportunity to gain access to the industry is unacceptable. Therefore, this legislative session, the ACLU of Maryland, leaders of Before Struggle, and others will be supporting legislation that will be introduced by Senator Carter, which we see as a companion bill to the uh, as a companion to the referendum bill introduced by Delegate Luke Klippinger. So this bill will um, do a few things. Um, first, they will legalize marijuana for Marylanders who are 21 and older. Of course, as everyone understands by now, police encounters are more likely to lead to abusive policing for BIPOC people. Legalizing marijuana is one way to reduce the unnecessary police encounters for black and brown people. Moreover, we are talking about consensual adult behavior. Criminalizing marijuana does, not, does nothing to keep our community safe. This bill will also include safeguards to ensure that those that are found in violation of the bill's provisions are not faced with unreasonable financial burden. So for example, a $150 civil fine for violations instead of criminal penalties. Next, the bill will raise the legal possession limit to four ounces and allow Marylanders to argue in court that possession of four ounces or less is not enough to charge someone with, with possession um, with intent to distribute. Since decriminalization of, of possession of 10 grams of marijuana in 2016, the Uniform Crime Reports show an uptick in distribution charges. Specifically, according to the 2015 Uniform Crime Report, as compared to 2014, arrests for possession of marijuana decreased 37%, while marijuana distribution um, increased 5% in 2015. This trend suggests that at least some portion of the persons in possession of 10 grams or less are now being charged with distribution offense, when the offense may in fact be more appropriately charged as possession. In other words, law enforcement has found a way around the decriminalization law because they can no longer prosecute persons for possession of small amounts of marijuana. They are, they are instead prosecuting persons for possession with intent to distribute for even small, for even small amounts. When the Maryland General Assembly decriminalized possession, it did so with the goal of reducing unnecessary criminalization, particularly for black and brown people. In order to honor that goal, there must be a, a minimum quantity or a floor for distribution charges. Next, the bill will prohibit um, using the odor of marijuana without other legitimate cause for suspicion as uh, the probable cause for arrest um, and to perform warrantless search or of a person or a vehicle. It's critical to understand that this effort is not just about marijuana. It's about de-incentivizing pretextual police searches and seizures. Marijuana is often a pretextual, uh, used as a pretextual basis for police to stop and search people, disproportionately black and brown people. This provision will prevent law enforcement from relying on the odor of marijuana to justify stopping and searching Marylanders. Of course, public safety is of the utmost importance for all of our communities, but diligent law enforcement um, can and should be uh, should be used to solve crime um, using honest and evidence-based techniques without relying on pretextual uh, bases like the odor of marijuana for stopping and searching people. Um, next, the bill will allow uh, for vacature of previous marijuana-related convictions and mandate opportunities for reconsideration hearings and vacature for those currently serving time for marijuana-related convictions and other low-level felonies and misdemeanors if those charges stem from a conviction based on the search uh, based on a search due to the odor of marijuana. This aspect of the bill is basically a look back to give people relief, uh, to give some uh, give people relief um, who have already been harmed by the war on drugs. Because of the destructive war on drugs, so many people are currently saddled with criminal records. It's and it's important that we have um, that those who have already gone through the legal just the justice the legal justice system have an opportunity to clear their records if their convictions were marijuana related or the charges arose from an officer detecting the odor of marijuana. Vacature means that there's there was a mistake made in the original conviction and goes further than expungement by reversing the actual adjudication or finding of guilt and is not the same thing as expungement or shielding and is not um, and this process will not be automatic. Vacature will especially be important for immigrant Marylanders. Cannabis remains illegal under the federal uh, law and can still lead to serious immigration consequences. So this will allow immigrant Marylanders, among others, uh, to request a judge um, to vacate their previous convictions in a manner that the US immigration law will recognize. And lastly, before I turn over to Davon, um, the bill will also ensure that the legal use of marijuana cannot be the basis of denying someone housing, making child custody or visitation determinations, or negatively impacting someone's parole or probation status. Criminal penalties are only the tip of the iceberg. Marijuana convictions negatively impact people in countless ways, from access to stable housing to custody rights. So this provision will begin to address some of the ripple effects of the, criminaliz the criminalization of marijuana. And uh, with that, I'll turn over to Davon to discuss the community reparations aspect of the bill. 
Thank you so much, Yannette. And uh, so next we're gonna hear from Davon Love, Director of Public Policy for Leaders of a Beautiful Struggle. So it's important the frame that is used. Hold on one second. Um, let me make sure to pin you. Hold on a second, Davon. Sorry about the delay. There you go, go ahead. All right. So it's important that the frame that is that we use um, as partners on this issue, um, it's important, I think, for the general public to be clear. So, um, you know, I want to start with a quote from Minister Malcolm X, where he said that you can't put a knife in a person's back nine inches, pull it out through and you say you've made progress. You have to pull it out and begin to heal before you can say progress is made. And so in many respects, um, Yannette lays out um, the criminal justice aspects of cannabis legalization that looks to reverse and stop the bleeding that's been happening as a result of these policies that have criminalized people of African descent and people of color more broadly. But that work isn't complete if we don't talk about the importance of investing in the communities harmed by the uh, communities harmed by the war on drugs in a way that repairs the damage that is done. Now what you'll notice is that we have not talked about the regulatory or business aspect of it. And I want to briefly mention that there are a variety of legislators thinking about the question of making sure that there's meaningful Black participation in the cannabis industry. Um, there are market forces, particularly the extremity of the lack of access to capital and the disparities in wealth. Um, you know, the average white family on average has about 16 times the wealth of an average Black family. Um, and so the market forces uh, make it difficult to imagine kind of a singular government intervention um, that would guarantee Black participation into the regulatory business side. Um, I wanted to mention that because I want folks to be clear that that's something that we're thinking about and we'll, and we'll be talking to legislators throughout session to make sure that that part is right. But given the fact that a new industry, a new multi-million, multi-billion dollar industry will create the opportunity for, for tax revenues. And typically when new industries emerge, um, oftentimes those revenues go back to the general fund. We think it's important that a majority in, in the legislation that uh, we're working with Senator Carter um, to put forward, that at least 60% of the tax revenues go back into the communities impacted by the war on drugs. And the way that we advocate that that happens specifically is that the jur jurisdictions would receive a percentage of those overall revenues proportional to the amount of marijuana related arrests in those jurisdictions over the past 30 years. So for instance, let's say Baltimore City was responsible for 20% of marijuana related arrests over the past 30 years, they get 20% of the overall revenue expenditure from the revenue to make sure that those resources are, are spent equitably um, to jurisdictions that are the most in need of it. And that the this, in terms of specifically where those resources are allocated, that those resources are that's determined by the governing body of those jurisdictions, those city and county councils. Now, I know a lot of people's initial thought in hearing that is, well, you know, I don't trust local government necessarily to make those kind of determinations. The issue of reparations is important because when we talk about investment in community, we're talking about the complicated nature of community reinvestment. We're getting public dollars to the community. It's just a very difficult task for those who have been in a position to be responsible for directing public dollars, particularly to grassroots organizations, just given the infrastructure that is needed. Um, and given the fact that there aren't any mainstream, there aren't any big um, intermediary institutions that are universally trusted that can just be given those dollars and dispersed to the community, right? That infrastructure needs to be built. And in many ways, that's, that's a separate but related conversation. We believe that the best opportunity there is for the public to be able to shape the way that those resources are spent is by being able to have access to their local um, county council or city council person and putting pressure on them to shape what those allocations look like. In other contexts where resources are given to counties, oftentimes they give it directly to the executive which reduce, you know, the, the mayor, the county executive, which reduces the public's opportunity to actually play a role in how those resources are spent. So what we, and there will certainly be guardrails, right? Guardrails that include that um, the revenues would not be used for law enforcement, that those revenues wouldn't be used to supplant existing government programs um, or services, right? So there would certainly be guardrails that would make, that would help to make sure that those resources get to the communities that are most in need. 
And so what we what we feel like we put forward, given that there aren't any ideal ways, just given the lack of infrastructure in the nonprofit sector as it relates to getting money to grassroots organizations, we feel that this approach provides the best opportunity for the public to be able to play a significant role in, in where those resources go. Um, and so that is the community reinvestment aspect of the issue of legalizing uh, recreational marijuana um, but using a reparations lens to make sure that we not just address the criminal justice aspects of this, which is important, but making sure that we get resources into the communities that harm has been done to, to begin the work of repairing the harm that's been done by the policies of the state of Maine. Thank you so much, Davon. And next we are going to talk about empowering the Baltimore Civilian Review Board. And um, we are going to hear from Davon again and also Tierra Hawks from the Baltimore Civilian Review Board. Um, but first we're going to hear from Davon. And um, so when you're ready, go ahead. So I imagine many folks who have followed the work on police accountability reform in the 2021 General Assembly, HB 670, um, was the kind of one of the major um, piece of legislation that passed. And what one of the things that happened, and we and we believe an honest oversight of leadership in the legislature, was an oversight on the issue that Baltimore City um, and Prince George's County are two jurisdictions that have a pre-existing civilian oversight structure. HB 670 that requires the establishment of police accountability boards. Those police accountability boards would serve as the container for the community to bring complaints against police officers. And it would be the and the police accountability board um, would serve in that role um, as being able to represent the community in the larger matrix of the new disciplinary process that was laid out by HB 670 in the 2021 General Assembly. Given that Baltimore City uh, via the 1999 statute that establishes the Civilian Review Board, um, it being a structure that's existed since then, already having you know procedures and infrastructure around um, commu be the community being able to make complaints against law enforcement, and already having some of its own powers in terms of investigatory uh, potential um, or or powers rather, then the the issue is we don't want two duplicative entities that would exist in Baltimore City, right? Just administratively, that is a nightmare. Um, and in terms of the residents, that, that's just a nightmare. And so what we're looking to do is take the work that the CRB has done, right? The CRB has done tremendous work, particularly over the past few years and being revamped and being an entity that is responsive to the community and able to play a role in providing the community a window in terms of community oversight. Um, and so we, what we proposed um, is that the powers and responsibilities um, that are assigned in HB 670 of the police accountability boards, that those be assigned to the civilian review board in Baltimore City, essentially as a carve out, <clears throat> as an efficient and um, is an efficient and streamlined way of fulfilling the obligations of HB 670, while also building on the work that's been done um, by the civilian review board in the direction of making sure the community has a mechanism of oversight over law enforcement. Um, so that's essentially what we're advocating for. Um, and uh, I guess we kick it to uh, Meredith to kick it to Tierra to talk about the CRB and its position on this. Thank you so much. And hold on one moment. I'm gonna pin Tierra Hawks, um, chair of the Baltimore City Review Board. Let me put your name and title in the chat. And when you're ready, go ahead. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. The CRB is in full support of this bill because it has the potential to strengthen the powers of the Civilian Review Board and provide us with the resources to be an efficient and effective community oversight board in Baltimore City. Um, I think that strong independent civilian oversight of police conduct is fundamental to having safe communities and effective policing. And then when we're looking at enhancing and as we strive to reach police accountability and transparency, um, I think this is one step that gets us closer to that goal. The Baltimore City Civilian Review Board is the only entity in Baltimore City that has that currently has the authority to independently investigate complaints of police misconduct and make disciplinary recommendations. Um, the CRB provides a safe space for citizens to file complaints 
on issues of um, we have five statutorily mandated regulations that we fall under, and that's harassment, abusive language, excessive force, false arrest, and false imprisonment. Um, and those things are from Baltimore City um, law enforcement officers. We had the opportunity um, to review the list of all the complaints that are submitted to the uh, PIB and determine if they fall within those five categories. Um, unfortunately, um, a lot of those complaints do not fall within our five categories and we often have no authority over the complaint. Um, with this bill, it would give us the ability of the PAB board to um, review all the complaints and we'd be able to see everything. Con um, that includes conduct on becoming of an officer, if there's just straight negligence by an officer, all of those things. Um, one example of a case that we received was um, over the um, pandemic, uh, a Baltimore City police officer um, was recorded purposely coughing on a resident. And um, this, this was an embarrassment, I think, to our community. And the video was disseminated across all social media platforms. Um, it was submitted to the CRB and we couldn't necessarily do what we wanted to do with it because it didn't fall within the five allegations that we um, as a civilian reward can currently review. Um, let's see, expanding the CRB scope um, of review will allow the CRB to include those PAB responsibilities um, such as the conduct I'm becoming and things like that. The CRB is currently composed of nine voting members who are residents of Baltimore City who have a variety of career and experiences. Um, the board includes a mathematician, a few attorneys, a school counselor, um, an organizational psychologist, and a nurse. So we have a couple of different um, positions um, or a couple of different career oriented people who give a broad um, perspective on police accountability and what that means to them and how um, citizens should be treated in Baltimore City. Um, we also have non-voting members such as the ACLU who are on our board who provide um, um, advice and um, insight into interests and concerns and things that may come up in our meetings. Um, we also have our CRB investigators that diligently um, investigate our complaints, they're reviewed, they're discussed, and then they're voted on by the board. Um, as Davon stated, over the years, the CRB has become a more robust, I think, impactful and, and relevant organization. We are a part of the consent decree. So we're mandated to be a part of this process. And um, with the Police Accountability Board, it has kind of um, left us with some decisions to be made about how we're to move forward. And I think by this bill giving the CRB more power on, or trying to merge us into a Police Accountability Board, it does exactly what the CRB was mandated to do in its original statutory authority or what I think the purpose was in the beginning. It's evident to us um, and to me that the police cannot police themselves and civilian oversight is necessary to ensure an appropriate and fair um, disciplinary process for police misconduct. Um, the moment that a police officer's engagement with a citizen becomes concerning or outside of the scope of duty, the CRB should have the authority to investigate it and to um, issue a, some type of discipline or some type of recommendation. Um, but despite these limitations, the current CRB has a strong infrastructure of systems and people in place involved now that are doing the best that they can given the limitations that we have. Um, and it really doesn't make sense for us to start all over and to lose what's been institutionally um, set in stone um, with the knowledge and assistance that we have um, to just ignore it and to um, move forward with something else. So the CRB is ready and able to expand to take on the roles and responsibilities assigned to um, a police accountability board while maintaining our current um, scope and powers um, I think we're willing and able to do it. And I think this board helps, I mean, this bill helps us to do those things. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, next, we are going to shift our focus to um, two related issues, uh, two issues related to children. Um, we are going to talk about children's due process rights and also taking police out of schools. And first we are going to hear from um, Justin Nally, public policy analyst with 
the ACLU of Maryland. Let me pin you, Justin. There we go. And when you're ready, please go ahead. Thank you, Merida. Well, first I'll discuss the Child Interrogation Protection Act and the reason behind this legislation. So the right to counsel for children was established in 1967 due to a landmark Supreme Court case and it held that children had the right to remain silent and then no child could be convicted unless compelling evidence is presented in a course under the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. But in Maryland, law enforcement is um, not required to uh, make sure that these children have their due process rights or required to call parents or attorneys before a child is interrogated. Now, Black children are particularly harmed in the criminal legal system because of that. This lack of protection of children is on full display through various touch points and interactions with children with law enforcement. 90% of all complaints against Black children are filed by police, including school police and school resource officers. In addition, Black students are more likely to be arrested in school than any other racial or ethnic groups combined. It is also shown in the research that children make better decisions with legal support. Studies show that children waive their Miranda rights at at least a 90% rate and make false confessions at a rate higher than adults. So although uh, children arrests have declined over time, there are still over 30,000 children under the age of 10 that have been arrested in the United States from 2014 to 2018. And in Maryland, children as young as seven can be ensnared in the criminal legal system. So what we have uh, today is a bill that we're proposing for the third year, which is the Child, Prote Child Interrogation Protection Act. It is currently filed under Senate Bill 53 uh, by Senator Joe Carter of Baltimore City, and the cross-file will be Delegate Sandy Bartlett of Anne Arundel County, which will be filed on the first day of session. Now, this bill does three main things. The first, it requires law enforcement to make and document attempts to notify parents or guardians of a child who is in police custody. The second major thing that the bill does is allow the Court of Appeals to adopt age-appropriate language for how children are advised of their rights when they are in law, um, legal custody of police officers. And lastly, it requires that the children in custody have a consultation with an attorney or a public defender or a private attorney before any interrogation takes place. Now we're working with a number of advocacy organizations, including Jenny Eager from the Office of the Public Defender on this legislation. And one thing that we want to make sure that it's important to get across this year, because this is the last legislative session for this legislative body. So we were able to pass the bill in the House in 2021. We're looking to really focus on passing this bill in the Senate for 2022. And it has to be passed in case there is a veto, because the veto needs to be overridden during this session, or we'll have to start again in 2023. Um, so I will stop there and pass it to uh, my colleague, Jenny Egan, to go into any further detail about this legislation. Hold on one moment. Let me uh, replace the pin here. All right, Jenny, you're all set. Great. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Justin. The reason that this bill is so important is that this is a bill about protecting the due process and constitutional rights of children. This is not about a particular crime or a particular punishment. It's about protecting the rights of kids. And when do we need to safeguard children's rights the most? When there is the most at risk and the stakes are highest when children are facing decades in prison. As Justin cited, Studies have shown children simply do not understand what their rights are in custodial settings. They are trained and primed to comply with authority and to do what adult, adults tell them to do. The same reason we don't allow children to sign contracts or get married or serve in the military or buy alcohol or tobacco is the same reason we should not allow them to give up their constitutional rights when their freedom is, is, is at stake until they've spoken to a lawyer. <clears throat> That's why big organizations like the American Academy of Children and Adolescent Psychiatry and the American Psychological Association all agree that children should be allowed to have a lawyer before they are interrogated. Um, <clears throat> this bill is not just good for kids, it's also good for law enforcement because it helps protect the integrity of investigations and it ensures that victims get the justice they deserve. 
Nothing is worse than a victim learning years later that a person they thought had hurt them was actually the real, uh, was actually innocent and the real perpetrator is still at large. We know that if this was your child, if, if your child uh, was in the custody of law enforcement, you would want to be notified if they were arrested. Wouldn't you want to make sure that they had a professional who knew everything about the system, a lawyer, to advise you and them about how to protect their rights and keep them safe? We can do that, uh, but we need to make sure that this bill gets through the Senate uh, early, uh, as Justin outlined. Uh, we had great success in the House last year. We have great champions uh, and supporters of this bill, but we need to make sure that it does not get stuck uh, behind everything else because Maryland was ranked in 2020 as one of the worst offenders when it comes to children's rights in the, uh, in the legal system. We are one of the worst states in the United States in protecting kids' rights. We need to fix that and we can do it this session. Thank you so much. And um, next we are going to talk about um, the right to education, improving funding and ending the school to prison pipeline. And we're gonna hear from Frank Patanella, who's a senior um, education advocate with the ACLU of Maryland. <clears throat> Let me switch the pin over to you, Frank. And when you're ready, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Meredith, and hello, everyone. Um, most people know that teachers are burning out quickly. Uh, the impact of the pandemic has been severe. Uh, teachers are being asked to do a number of additional tasks to implement, to implement uh, learning recovery. Um, and there's been ongoing disruptions and confusion due to the pandemic. Um, there are staffing shortages, uh, resignations happening, and all school districts are having a hard time um, hiring staff. Um, I'm hearing a lot from the school level, from students and parents, and they are confused about what's going on, protocols around COVID testing and quarantining, uh, the different aspects of learning recovery, and what resources are available to them, um, and options for online learning and more. Uh, if there's an opportunity to get on the, the right path um, this year, um, as you know, the, the legislature overrode the governor's veto on this uh, education reform bill called the Blueprint for Maryland's Future last year. It's a $4 billion spending bill um, spread out or phased in over a 10-year period. Um, for this session, um, this is the first uh, session where there's going to be a large, the first large investment called for by the, the Blueprint law. And that's because um, this um, this is the first year the governor's directed by law to in include that uh, increased amount. Um, we're going to advocate for that full amount to come through uh, via the blueprint plan. Um, that means probably an additional 100, uh, 520 to about 580 million for this fiscal year, and that's statewide. Um, most of the increase directed by the the blueprint. Um, will go into the per pupil um, funding formula. So all schools should see an increase um, in per pupil funding. Um, in talking to community members, um, they're having a hard time understanding the changes that uh, they'll see in their school due to the blueprint law and due to the federal law. There's a large, there has been a large infusion of federal dollars for schools. So that's in the mix. And what schools are trying to do is use the federal funding to jumpstart some of the blueprint programs. So they're trying to hire staff, they're trying to get ahead a bit in the implementation of blueprint programs um, with, the, with knowing that the federal funding will go away and that they're, they're, they're trying to design their um, use of state funding to supplant the money that goes away from the federal so they can maintain staff that they hire now. Um, and that's just a confusing thing. Um, right now, the accountability and implementation board that was established by the blueprint law, and it is it was established to um, oversee um, all of the blueprint programming and new spending coming from this law. Um, that the governor has not given the money over the 3.8 million that was um, identified um, to them uh, to him by the governor. I'm sorry, by the legislature. Um, 
to staff up the accountability and implementation board. So right now that board has an executive director, but it has no staff. And there's a number of um, deadlines coming up for reporting on implementation of blueprint programs and um, learning recovery plans. Um, these, they're gonna be late. Um, on the reporting. Uh, districts need a lot more guidance in terms of what is required by the law. And since the accountability board is not funded, um, that guidance has not come. So we may see uh, something called a blueprint uh, 3.0 bill. Um, it's not gonna be a big bill, um, but, and it will, it will hopefully address um, timeline on the implementation of blueprint programs. So when certain programs are expected to be established, when local reports are due to, to the state and, and things like that. Um, we've been hearing recently that the state has a structural surplus, which is the first time I've ever heard that phrase, structural surplus, um, meaning that there is um, additional revenue that is currently not encumbered, that is available to the General Assembly and the governor for, for spending. So this could be used to improve um, the funding um, um, phase in of the blueprint plan. Again, it's a $4 billion plan that um, is designed to phase in over 10 years, but uh, the legislature and the governor can agree to in, uh, speed up that funding. Um, because districts have been chronically underfunded over the past 10 years, especially districts with the largest um, populations of black and brown students and districts of the lowest wealth. These districts are standing in the deepest holes. And by the state's own measure of what adequate funding is, those districts are also the, uh, the most underfunded. So um, they can do a lot to equalize things, to bring more equity um, to the students that need it most. Um, another thing that we're looking at uh, for this session is um, asking for an adequacy analysis of the blueprint formula. So back in the 90s, uh, mid 90s, the ACLU brought a lawsuit called the Bradford versus the Maryland State Board of Education um, <clears throat> representing Baltimore City families. The lawsuit contended that the state was not abiding by their constitutional requirement of funding Baltimore City schools adequately. Um, in the end, um, we received favorable ru rulings um, at different times, and the state responded by setting up what was called the Thornton Commission way back 20 years ago in 2000. The Thornton Commission was the first iteration of the Kerwin Commission, and that commission's recommendations were adopted to, into law in 2000, um, two, 2002. Um, that that uh, Thornton law um, established what is called um, adequacy targets for every district. So that's what the state determined that each district needed to meet adequate funded funding to ensure that um, students um, had the resources and staffing um, required um, to meet the standards that the state itself has adopted and required students to, to meet. Um, they did no such thing for the, uh, the Kerwin Commission did not do that. Um, and, and the current law um, does not have adequacy targets. So we don't know what adequate funding is. Um, so we're gonna ask for the state to provide an adequacy analysis of the formula so that the public can know what the formula will pay for. There's different aspects of the formula, such as the, the, the basic per pupil foundation amount that every school district gets based on enrollment. There are multipliers for students who are from low income families, uh, from immigrant families um, who and those who require special education. Um, that all, um, uh, the formula considers all those things and provides a certain amount of money for the school districts, but it is unknown what those amounts um, will lead to in terms of staffing at their schools, programming and resources, uh, resources at their schools. So it's important to, to get an adequacy study. And alongside of this, we're also still litigating the Bradford case. So, um, you know, if this doesn't get fixed in the legislature, it will get um, addressed in court. <clears throat> Um, we are advocating, onto another topic, we are advocating for uh, school construction funding to remain high 
It has been um, high in recent years. Um, we heard that the governor might reduce uh, school construction funding for this upcoming fiscal year. Currently, the annual amount is somewhere around $440 million that's appropriated um, through different programs uh, targeting health and safety issues in schools, targeting uh, schools that need to expand or build additions because they're overcrowded or build new schools um, to accommodate um, uh, increased enrollment. Um, we are so we're advocating to maintain that amount. There's also the $2.2 billion uh, Built to Learn Act. It's a one-time investment um, of that uh, in that amount of $2.2 billion, and it will be distributed to um, districts uh, statewide over the next several years. Um, and we are also, um, this is back in 2018, uh, the Not Bill. We were able to um, get into that bill. Um, a requirement for the state to assess all school buildings, the condition and um, whether or not they, um, or how well they support the educational program. Um, there's something like reported by the state school construction program, um, $20 billion that are needed to uh, fix deficiencies. So health and safety deficiencies, um, build new schools to accommodate um, new enrollment. Um, and for just general renovations so that the school building can actually support the curriculum, such as new science labs and commuter, computer and uh, media and library resources. Um, without a, an accurate and comprehensive assessment, the state doesn't will, won't have that data to be able to direct funding. So we asked for this assessment. It was completed last year. But based on what we've seen, based on feedback from uh, local school districts, the data is inaccurate and um, incomprehensive, uh, not comprehensive. So there's going to be law to try to, uh, a bill to try to fix this, um, fix those flaws to ensure that there is accurate data and comprehensive data so that in future years, state money can be directed to the districts with the greatest needs um, and those districts with the least capacity in terms of wealth to address those needs. And lastly, um, we are looking um, to advocate for a bill that has been introduced um, a couple times and it was put on hold last year. Um, this bill is HB uh, 23. Um, and the goal of this bill is to ensure that the data that the state collects on suspensions and discipline um, is made public and that um, this data is presented in a way that is uh, disaggregated for race, uh, gender, um, income, um, special education, um, immigrant, immigrant, immigration status, and, and so forth. Um, this data right now is hard to um, track down. It's hard to access. So we want this on, on the MSD website um, and, and also listed by school. So you can look at schools and see what schools are trending in the right direction to reduce the disparities in um, discipline and, and suspensions of uh, black and brown students. Um, or we can see what schools are, are moving in the wrong direction or doing things that are legal like suspending uh, uh, students that are um, in second grade and below. Um, we passed the law in 27, uh, 2017 to prevent that. But still some, some schools have, have not gotten the memo. Um, so this is an accountability and, and, and trans, uh, transparency measure. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Frank. And we are also going to um, close on one more very important issue related to children in schools. Um, and that is um, related to moving us further in the direction of uh, removing police from schools, but also creating supports that students and the school community needs to address um, those issues. So we're gonna hear again from Justin Nally, um, public policy analyst with the ASLU of Maryland. Let me pin you here, Justin. And please go ahead when you're ready. Thank you, Merida. Following up from Frank's point in the data that we're collection to make sure that we see the data trends for suspensions, we know that every school district in Maryland employs school police despite evidence that school police presence results in criminalizing students for minor age appropriate behavior and creates that school to prison pipeline. 
In Maryland, 70% of school arrests are for simple things like fist fights without weapons, offenses like disruption or disrespect in the classroom, trespassing, or simple drug possession. A simple schoolyard fight leads to a student being arrested for second degree assault. Taking a student's pencil winds up being a criminal charge for theft. These school arrests for these minor offenses are a byproduct of police presence in schools where students are five times more likely to be arrested for disorderly conduct than a school that does not have one. As I mentioned earlier with uh, those referrals from police into law enforcement, Black children and students with disabilities are disproportionately harmed by school policing. In Maryland, Black students really receive 56% of school-based arrests, despite only making up one-third of the entire student population. Students with IEPs also receive 23% of school-based arrests, despite only comprising 12% of the student population. Now, as we move forward and educate folks about police presence in schools, we have uh, gone forward with a bill that we introduced last session, which is called Counselors Not Cops, that really takes money that the state allocates and puts it to more beneficial services for students. Now, the bill is sponsored by Delegate Janelle Wilkins of Montgomery County, which will be filed uh, this week in the first day of session. It was introduced last year, but did not receive a vote in the committee. So what this bill does is redirect $10 million a year in the state SRO fund towards more beneficial programs for students regarding mental health services, wraparound supports, restorative approaches, so that schools can hire counselors, social workers, school psychologists, school restorative practices, practitioners, community school coordinators, and implementing trauma-informed practices. So we're working for this bill within the Maryland Coalition for Justice and Police Accountability and the Coalition to Reform School Discipline. Similar to the child interrogation bill, we'll have to pass this bill early enough so that any veto any veto by the governor occurs, we're able to override it in the 2022 session. So uh, that is the child portion of what we're trying to accomplish this legislative session. Thank you so much, Justin, for sharing information about that important issue and to all of our panelists for um, sharing your expertise with us today.